Our guest today is uh, Doug Crockford of Yahoo, uh, speaking about gears and the mashup problem. And um, just a short intro, uh, uh, Doug and I worked together at Electric Communities, a company that he was a founder of, uh, where we worked on a uh, graphical social virtual reality. And uh, we were doing um, uh, distributed secure scripting of, um, of world objects, which is a uh, precursor of the kind of master problem that the world faces today. Uh, so um, uh, that's, and here's Doug. Hi, hello everybody. Uh, while we're struggling with the video, let me begin by introducing myself. Um, first, I, I will establish my identity by showing you my California driver's license. <laughs> Um, let's see. Here's my uh, Yahoo employee identification, just so you know. And you also have the kind words that Mark gave you. Great. Um, but you don't just have to believe me. Um, it, it's important also to establish yourself in terms of reputation uh, with other people. So Brendan Eich, who is the uh, creator of JavaScript, said of me, that I am the Yoda of Lambda programming and JavaScript. <laughs> and by that, he meant that I am instructing all the young web Padawans on the nature of JavaScript and, and Lambda, and also referring to my skills as a, with a lightsaber. <laughs> um, some of you may also be aware that I am the, the discoverer of JSON, the uh, popular data interchange format. And on that, Dave Weiner said, Jason is not even XML. Who did this travesty? Let's find a tree and string them up now. <laughs> Fortunately, nobody listens to Dave Weiner. Um, on, on a similar topic, um, James Clark, who's the architect of XML and uh, uh, XSLT, said, any damn fool could produce a better data format than XML, which it turns out is true. So um, I, I hope I have now established a trust relationship with you. <laughs> uh, you've inspected my credentials. You've inspected my reputation. Uh, you are now prepared to believe everything that I tell you. And, and you should, because everything I'm going to tell you is true. Uh, except for the joke about the lightsabers. I, I was at Lucasfilm for eight years. I was director of technology there, and I never got any good at lightsabers. It, those things turn out to be a whole lot harder than they are in the movies. So what I'm here uh, to talk about today is not me, but to talk about security with respect to the web, which I, I think is a topic which is of critical importance to all of us. Uh, security is the number one biggest problem in the whole World Wide Web. Um, and it is a consequence of the way that the web came together. Um, we, a, a common practice we see in application and platform development, which is still going on, which is ship it now and secure it later. Um, we'll get it to market quickly, establish that we did the right thing, and then later we'll try to figure out what the act, right thing actually was. And that turns out is really, really hard. And we have a lot of examples of this. Um, but somehow we, we haven't learned it yet. And so we're still seeing new platforms coming to market almost daily, which uh, do not concern themselves with security, thinking that they can fix it at a later time, perhaps by adding a security module or some other mechanism. Um, and that has a lot to do with where we are. One of the consequences of that is you tend to see a lot of application models which have a security model which is basically blame the victim in which we routine, re, routinely ask questions of the user which they cannot possibly answer. Even if they understood the question, we don't give them sufficient information to answer it. Um, and all it does is allow us to say it's their fault for making the wrong choice. This is an intolerable way to do security systems. And any security which is based on this uh, is, a, is a false promise. But it, it's uh, commonly practiced. Um, we also see in the web um, policies and mechanisms which prevent useful things and allow dangerous things. One of the worst examples of this is the same origin policy. Um, it uh, is standing in the way of progress in the web, um, but is not sufficiently adequate for protecting the things that it claims to protect now. Uh, we also see a lot of circumvention to get around the same origin policy, which impair security even further. Big problem. Um, so that's the state of the web. 
the web is 3270 for the 21st century. At least that's what it was. It's gotten better recently. Now, some of the youngsters in the audience might be wondering, what does 3270 mean? Is that a year or, or what? No, it's actually a piece of gear. Uh, this is a 3270. This is a terminal that was built by IBM toward the end of the time-sharing era. Uh, time-sharing was a process in which um, a big, expensive computer would be shared by a lot of people at the same time. Um, and IBM wasn't very good at it. Um, their operating systems, for some reason, weren't, were not able to do a process which, in response to user input, um, so they tended to, to not work very well. So the way they got around that was by developing the 3270, which at the time was called an intelligent terminal. And the way it worked was the mainframe would pump a page full of stuff to it with some holes in it. The user would fill in the holes and push the tab key to go to the next hole. And when the whole page was filled in, they would send it back. They would push the submit button and, and it would go back to the mainframe. So when the web happened, there were a lot of dinosaurs out there who looked at that and said, oh yeah, 3270, we remember how to do that. Um, so we saw a lot of web application architecture which was lifted directly from the 3270 model. Now the problem with that was the same problem with the 3270 itself, was it was a step backwards in terms of interactivity. You just can't interact in a, in a flexible way when you're limited to page transitions. And so getting away from that was recognized as a major opportunity for the web. Um, the first approach at restoring that interactivity was Java. When Java was introduced and when they teamed up with Netscape, there was huge excitement that Java was going to fix the web and allow the web to be the um, application platform that would allow us to be liberated from Microsoft. It turned out, unfortunately, though, that Java was a huge failure as an applet technology, which was the thing it was uh, introduced as. It was very popular. It had huge acceptance. If you went into any bookstore in the Valley at that time and you know, go to Printers Inc. or Computer Lib or Stacy's and go to the computer section, fully half the computer books there were about Java. It, it was, there was enormous interest. Um, but the right once run everywhere promise was not kept. And so for people who are trying to develop applications in Java, it was more like write once, run away screaming. It, <laughs> it was really, really hard. Um, they had an unworkable blame the victim security model, and they had a really tedious UI model, very, very difficult to use. Now, uh, they failed on, on the <coughs> applet level, but they were turned out very successful as a server technology, basically because with servers, you don't have to run everywhere. You just have to run in the server. And, and Java was pretty good at that. Um, the security model didn't matter because it, uh, a server isn't expected to run untrusted code. And you don't do a lot of UI modeling or UI programming in, in servers. So it did really well there. But it left a vacuum on the browser side. Um, now, the thing that Java taught us, and, and we knew this going in, was that running everywhere securely and interactively is really, really hard. Um, but it turns out JavaScript is doing it, and is doing it pretty damn well. So let's look at where JavaScript came from. JavaScript was developed at Netscape uh, by people who, I guess, figured that Java was the wrong idea. And I think they saw that correctly. Um, JavaScript. Uh, gave a programming model similar to HyperCard to the browser. That was a very interesting step forward, uh, first seen in Netscape Navigator 2. Microsoft took that idea and pushed it in a really interesting way. First off, um, they made their clone of JavaScript, and they called it JScript, not because they considered it to be a different thing, but because Sun claimed the ownership of the JavaScript trademark. And Microsoft and Sun were not getting along well in those days. So, Microsoft called it JScript. Um, it was an extremely high fidelity clone of, of Netscape's JavaScript engine. Um, they did such a good job that virtually all of the bugs and design errors that were incorporated into the original JavaScript were faithfully copied into JScript. <laughs> and in fact, when um, Netscape then went to ECMA to have the thing standardized in an attempt to prevent Microsoft from running away with it, uh, ECMA, which was the Computer European, Commuter, European Computer Manufacturers Association, uh, called the specification ECMAScript instead of JavaScript because they didn't want to deal with the sun either. And they 
uh, put into the standard virtually all of the bugs that Microsoft had discovered in the original implementation of JScript, and they, they remain in the language today. But despite that, um, it worked really well. Um, and the closeness of those implementations were amazing. So that JScript and JavaScript are more alike as implementations than any pair of implementations of any other language. And that's why the run everywhere thing is working in the web. Um, Microsoft also created a generalized document model where all elements are scriptable. This was a huge advance forward, very clever idea. They added the XML HTTP request. And in doing that, um, in IE4, and it got corrected in IE5 and 5.5, we had everything needed to do AJAX. All of the AJAX technologies were in place then. Then suddenly, five years later, Jesse James Garrett, um, a consultant at Adaptive Path, discovered AJAX. Um, it occurred to him that the interactivity that we had wanted back in the Java era that we didn't get and never got was possible using aspects of the browsers which were present. Um, and he called it AJAX, standing for Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, the adoption of AJAX has been huge. AJAX no longer seems to mean anything. Uh, AJAX is now just the way you do web applications. It, it's gone completely mainstream. Um, so AJAX is great. It gives us applications without installation, and that's important because installing of applications um, is annoying and it's dangerous, and it uh, asks users questions that they cannot successfully answer. So AJAX allows us to avoid that. We have the promise of um, highly interactive applications, at least when they're designed correctly. Um, we have the leverage of, of the social components of the web, which are huge and important. Um, the applications can be easy to use, again, assuming that they're designed correctly. Um, we have greater network efficiency than we had with the old style of 3270 applications because we don't have to do page replacements in response to every user interaction. But it is too damn hard to write these applications. And we're limited in how much we can push this platform going forward. The great thing to come out of Ajax is mashups. Mashups are by far the most interesting innovation in software development in 20 years. Um, mashups are really important at my company. I believe they're really important to Google as well. Being able to take bits of programs and rub them together and make new things all happening within the browser is wonderful and powerful. Um, but there's a problem. Mashups are insecure. Uh, mashups must not have access to any confidential information or any privileged connections to any servers. Um, this is an inherent problem in the browser, which uh, trips up mashups pretty significantly. And until this is fixed, mashups are constrained to only trivial applications. The really important, powerful applications are not possible until we fix the insecurity of mashups. And this is really critical because advertising is a mashup. Any ad which injects script into a page is mashing it up and is able to compromise um, the user's identity and connections to his servers and anything else that is mashed up in that page. Um, this is a huge problem and we need to fix it because it turns out uh, that's important. Um, so what are the causes of the problem? Well, one of them is JavaScript. Um, by design, JavaScript dumps all programs into a common global space. There is nothing to protect the secrets of one component from another, and any information which is available to any component is available to every component. That's just the nature of JavaScript, and it's because they did not anticipate that there would be multiple interests within a single page. Um, so a consequence of uh, that design decision in JavaScript was that we suffer now from XSS attacks, even in conventional web applications, where quoting errors or careless scripting uh, insertion can lead to compromise. Um, this is a, a big security problem, um, and there is no solution to it given the current state of the art. Um, the other source of the problem is the document object model. This is the API that the browser presents to JavaScript. In the DOM, all HTML elements are connected in a single tree so that every element is linked to its siblings and parent. Any element gets access to every element. Um, so all of the information on the page is at risk. Um, the, 
the nature of the web is sort of inverse to the way you think about security in other systems, which is one of the things which I think has made it historically difficult to think about. In most systems, the right to write is harder to obtain than the right to read. But in the web, a script can write to any domain or load and execute scripts from any domain, but it is severely constrained in what domains it can read from. Um, this is odd and unusual, but it is the nature of the web, and I don't see that we can change that either. Um, so if there is a script from two or more sources, the application is not secure, period. It's just the way the web works, which is really a shame because um, mashups require that we have scripts from multiple sources, and there's huge value that can be obtained if we can figure out how to do that. Web time, uh, some of the oldsters might remember, used to mean really fast. Back when Netscape was driving things, they were operating in web time, which meant that they could ship a whole new set of bugs every week. It was just amazing rates of change. But web time doesn't mean fast anymore. Web time now means really slow. And evidence of this is that Ep uh, ECMAScript was last revised in 1999. And HTML was last revised in 1999. The process by which we are pushing this technology forward has gotten to be painfully slow. Um, so um, I'm not looking for uh, any hope in fixing HTML or ECMAScript. I think we need to figure out some other way uh, to go forward. So looking at what has driven innovation historically. Um, uh, the web started as a proposal, as an idea, as a prototype. Um, and when you're at that level, change is really easy. If you change your mind about how something works, it just happens. It went pretty quickly to standardization. Um, and from standardization, other people started making browsers. And those browser makers at, uh, at Netscape and Microsoft and earlier in the uh, Mosaic group broke all the rules. They decided that the HTML spec and the related specs were inadequate and, uh, and some significant ways, and they just went and changed it. They, they would implement anything they wanted, and for many years they were able to get away with that. Um, that made things difficult for developers because everything was in flux and the standards were not well understood and constantly changing, and the set of bugs you had to deal with were, were constantly changing. Um, eventually that got flushed out, but um, it, it had the result of pushing the web technology forward very quickly. We can't... Uh, do that today. It would be just way too painful, way too destabilizing. The thing that's pushing the web forward today are the application developers. That taking the browser technology in its current state, the application developers have been pushing it in ways not expected, not anticipated, doing really powerful, useful things. Uh, in some cases, finding ways of, uh, of turning bugs into features. It's dangerous, it's in a way reckless, but it's producing a lot of value. But it's also starting to expose us to risk because it's causing us to adopt practices which are obviously dangerous. Um, so what we're working with today is repurposed browser technology, trying to make the, the best use out of what we've got um, since we haven't seen any progress really since 1999. This is good because it allows us to profoundly extend the platform, but it's bad because it takes pressure off of necessary improvements and it promotes very bad practices. Um, one of the very bad practices, for example, is the script tag hack. Uh, this is a, uh, a common thing in a lot of AJAX platforms and virtually all of the mashups for circumventing the same origin policy for accessing data. It's extremely unsafe. Um, I'm recommending instead a uh, capability called JSON request, which is a, a much better alternative for getting at stuff on other servers. It's available now as a, an extension in Firefox. We'd like it to see it become standard equipment in, in Firefox and in IE and everybody else. Uh, if you'd like to see more about it, uh, I recommend you go to json.org. Uh, Colin, are you here today? No, all right. Um, so what, what, if, if we kind of step back from the mess and look at, well, what would it have been had we gotten it right from the beginning? What sort of pieces would we have? And I think the place to start is with safe containers in which to execute programs. That would allow us to have be the first step toward achieving cooperation under mutual suspicion, which is what mashups require. So we start with what I'm going to call a VAT. 
Now that is just a, a, a computation container. You can put a program in the VAT and it can run there and, and compute all it wants, but it has no capability of doing input or output. It's just stuck in the VAT. Um, that by itself um, is not very interesting. It gets a little bit more interesting if I have two VATs. Now I can have two separate programs, uh, each running in its own container, unable to interfere with each other. And the fact that they cannot interfere, that there is this boundary between them, uh, which prevents them from uh, contaminating each other or stealing from each other, is really good. But it is not enough to allow cooperation. So I need some kind of channel which connects them, a very specific channel which allows them to exchange messages of a specific type uh, by which they can communicate, but which do not lead to compromise. This is the basic model that we need in order to do mashups. This is the fundamental primitive. Uh, once you have these connections, then you could consider having more VATs with more connections, and then, you, then the problem becomes figuring out who gets to talk to who. And that turns out to be a really interesting problem, but it's a lot nicer to think about than the problems we have to think about today. Um, another problem that we have with the browser right now is that it was designed strictly for online use. And as long as everybody's online, that's fine. But we're finding that we have applications now that have greater requirements for reliability. We're also finding um, greater requirements for mobility. And as we go more and more mobile, uh, connectivity is often harder to achieve in mobile. And so being able to work reliably offline is really, really important. One of the most important breakthroughs I've seen in this area is Google Gears. Google Gears is doing some really good stuff in providing us with uh, mechanisms which allow applications to develop offline solutions. I like Google Gears a lot. My favorite uh, feature of Google Gears is the worker pool. The worker pool looks a little bit like this. You've got a VAT, one of which represents a web page, and another represents a separate process in which you can run JavaScript. And you've got a channel which allows the two to talk to each other. Now, some of you may recognize that this looks just like the other picture that I showed representing the mechanism that you need, the foundation for secure systems. I think worker pool has it. I think that there could be modifications and extensions to the worker pool idea which get us to safe mashups. Um, I think it's too late to fix JavaScript. Um, there is work going on that. Um, uh, the ECMAS, ECMAS script has a committee which is trying to uh, extend the language. I think some of the extensions that we're looking at go way too far, will destabilize the language, or going to make it uh, extremely complicated, I think may actually make it more difficult to do programming in the language. Do not provide us any new capability. There's nothing that we can't do in the current language that we could do in the proposed language. And because it's so much more complex, thinking about its security properties is going to get even harder. Um, but I think that's OK. Uh, while JavaScript certainly needs fixing, I don't think we need to depend on fixing JavaScript security problems in, in, able, in order to go forward. We just need to put JavaScript in a vat. And the worker pools showed us how to do that. Um, so what I'm here to do today is to propose a generalization of the worker pool idea. Uh, so that worker pools are used not just to isolate um, processes in order to support offline operation, but become the fundamental primitive by which we build mashups. Um, so uh, in order to do that, we need to establish discovery, uh, um, introduction, and communication services that go not just between pages and worker pools, but pages and frames, page widgets, desktop widgets, web services, and everything so that this becomes the fundamental way in which everything gets mashed up. Flash, uh, Silverlight, everything gets mashed up in this way. Perhaps even desktop applications join the mashup. Uh, so some of the um, major components that we need, some of these already exist in Gears. We just need to, to tease them out and, and, and change their mission. We need an asynchronous message router. Um, so that um, every module gets a persistent, unguessable name, and that becomes its address for message passing. Uh, specific objects in modules can also be given um, unguessable names so that we can have finer granularity in the way that we create modules. Um, 
and that messages can be represented as JSON text. There might be optimizations which avoid that step, but uh, conceptually, everything is JSON text. So what gets sent between the modules is safe, that uh, you don't have leakage of capability. Uh, we would also need a module manager, um, which every module initially has a connection to, um, which provides discovery and identification services. So for example, um, modules from uh, representing the same site don't have to introduce each other going back to their common servers, but instead can figure out a way to find each other locally. Um, that could give us some uh, better performance uh, value. Um, and I think the module manager should also provide for some anti-phishing services um, so that uh, the user has a better chance of correctly answering some of the questions that are going to be asked. I, I think having these mechanisms, the sorts of questions we ask the user become important ones and, and answerable. Like, do you want to give this much money to, to that site? That, that becomes a much more interesting question than, do you want to allow that site to do something that you don't know what we're telling you what it's going to do, but it's going to do what, what you want. Um, having a mechanism like that, we can mash up everything. Everything becomes a mashup. I, I, I think the, the power of that is going to be huge, and it will radically change the way we think about application development. Operating systems were supposed to have provided these services, but um, never got it right. But I think by elevating this stuff to the web, we get the modularity boundaries right, and we get uh, the functional boundaries right. Um, and we get to mash up everything securely. And that's really important, because there's a lot of money at risk. So um, I'm imagining where we could have lots of components on a page or on a screen or anywhere. It doesn't really even matter anymore, uh, which are all capable of having persistent connections to each other, which can survive. Uh, disconnection from the network, perhaps can even survive uh, power cycling. Um, just a whole new way of thinking about how we build applications up from components. So here's what I'm proposing, specific proposal, that we reconsider the design of Google Gears to address the mashup problem as well as the offline problem, which I think is, it is already a long way toward solving that we develop mechanisms and policies that allow for the registration and exchange of rights to use channels. Um, then the hard part is figure out how to get it deployed in all of the new browsers and provide upgrades for the elderly browsers. Um, so the next step I'm proposing is the Mashup Solution Design Summit, in which we collect people from um, uh, the most interested parties, including Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, IBM, HP, Adobe, Facebook, and whoever else has a, a powerful interest in this problem. So that's why I'm here. Um, and we have some time for some questions. So are there, are there any questions? There's a microphone I see right there. So how do you avoid ending up with the blame the user security situation again here? I'm sorry, how do I avoid what? You, you were saying that one of the, one of the problems with, with Java was that they had sort of this blame the user thing mm -hmm. going on. And what about this will not you know, end us up in the same situation? Um, it's by having finer control over the capabilities that we're providing so that generally we're not asking the user to manage powerful relationships. Most of the relationships are going to be uh, uh, less powerful, less likely to cause harm, so the consequences of, of getting it wrong are, are insignificant. Everything is adequately contained. Uh, and also Mark Stiegler, everybody. Give me a hand. Uh, uh, I think I'm one of the originators of the uh, blame the uh, blame the victim uh, uh, phraseology. 
but in any event, uh, the, the way in which uh, we uh, computers blame the victim today is they ask you these ridiculous questions like, do you want to get your work done or uh, by, by giving all of your authority to this thing from somebody you don't know, or do you want to not get your work done? Neither of those uh, choices is acceptable. The only way you can get to the point where you can ask the user sensible questions is by having the rights that are going to be granted be things that make intuitive sense to the human being. So for example, in the, uh, uh, you know, if you've got PayPal and you've got uh, uh, a, a, a purchasing and Walmart on the same page at the same time, it makes sense to ask the user the question. He will understand the question. Do you want to transfer $5 from PayPal to Walmart to purchase this, uh, this, this thing of toothpaste? Uh, but it's not going to make sense to the user to say, do you want to give authority uh, over your entire PayPal account to Walmart? OK, that, that's a bad question. We shouldn't be asking that question. So that's. Mark Spiegler of HP, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So regarding JSON requests, uh, we discussed earlier about introducing the cross-site domain uh, request for XHR, which has been proposed by the, by the Web API group, has been implemented in for Firefox 3. Uh, do you still want to push JSON request? Uh, yeah. Um, there are a couple of arguments against JSON request. One of them is that it's not XML. I'm, I'm no longer very sympathetic to that argument. We don't need to support every mode of data transport in order to solve the masher problem. We just need one. So, yeah. so the proposal which is implemented in Firefox is data agnostic. So you can do JSON, you can do text, you can do XML, you can right. do which, whatever which, you want. Yeah, which, I, I don't see any value in that. The thing that I specifically don't like about that model is that it confuses the trust boundaries. Um, it, I, I showed you the diagram where we've got the, the two containers with the, the connection between them. Um, the only place we see that in the web is in the network itself, where we have the server and we have the browser and the thing between them. Um, so th that's a great thing. And you've got this natural trust boundary, which is the network itself in between them. And so I like a security model in which the server is responsible for what information it wants to give to the browser. I, um, I, I, that's the only way I, I, I think it makes sense to think about it. Anything else I, I think is ultimately going to break. The thing about the XHR model is that the trust boundary gets confused because the server is now trusting the browser to enforce its security policies. And historically, browsers have not been good defenders of security. Um, so I think it is misplacing where the secure design should go. Um, I know that there are lazy web developers, and I don't mean that as pejorative because all web developers are lazy. Um, and I mean that in the nicest way. Um, in fact, it's the, the hardworking ones that I'm suspicious of because they'll uh, work really hard at making things which are huge and, and unnecessarily big. Um, that don't want to put the proper discipline in the server. Um, and I, I don't want to encourage that kind of behavior. So uh, for those reasons, I'm, I'm very much more in favor of the JSON request. I think it has a simpler programming model, and I think it has a better security model. Thanks. Doug, can you say something about how the Google Gears and whatever else is involved in the solution you're proposing um, does something to enforce separation between programs that run and their access to different pieces of the DOM? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, sh I should describe the way that, that uh, the worker pool works. The motivating application was um, you've got a web application that needs to synchronize itself with um, information that it got from a server, or it needs to persist itself to a server. It, it has some process which could take a long time to do. Running that in the browser thread is not indicated because the browser UI is locked up for the life of that procedure, and that's really bad. Um, 
There have been people arguing that we should have threads in JavaScript. If you have multiple threads, then you could deal with that. But that turns out to be an extremely bad idea. Uh, you don't ever want to have multiple threads at the application level. That's madness. Because because it's impossible to think about threads. Um, so they're horrendously reliable. So the thing that Gears did, which was so, brilliant. So Doug, work, worker pools are event loops like in E? Uh, yes, they are. So a worker pool is a VAT with a JavaScript interpreter in it. It's thread isolated and memory isolated from the browser page. Um, so it, it's a completely independent VAT, but it's able to do messaging. Uh, so it, it's the fundamental primitive. It doesn't have any UI. Um, so that's one of the things we would think about is how do we provide UI to VATs. But everything else is there. It, it's, it's brilliant. And so how do um, scripts in the worker pool have constrained access to different pieces of the page? Uh, they have no access to the page. They, so have they, they make requests that somebody else mediates? Uh, Who mediates them? Uh, currently the page. So you can send requests to the script in the page, and it may or may not do whatever you ask, which is the right thing to have happen. So what I'm proposing is we generalize that model, uh, not just for worker pools, but for all of the modules that would participate in a mashup. Anybody else? OK, I think we're done here. Oh. This isn't really a question, just an observation. The, uh, uh, it occurs to me that the module manager that you uh, define in the architecture uh, operates a great deal like uh, the power box in most of the object capability work that we have done. It is, again, the thing that holds all of the uh, rights to, uh, with it, that, that exist within the entire browser. And its job is to mediate the granting of those rights, which is exactly a power box uh, pattern. I, I agree with that. One small remark here. Um, so Google, whether we like it or not, you know, we're an advertising company. We appeal to everybody. And we try and somehow make our work appeal to people who are not necessarily uh, willing to install anything new, uh, be that a new browser or a browser extension or whatnot. So one of the problems I think that we run into constantly and will continue to run into is um, sort of uh, the inconvenience of having to support the high road and the low road all the time. Um, and if this is going to be some foundational fabric for how mashups work, then we either need to support it in both the high road and the low road, or, um, or somehow we need to come up with a way for making that more ubiquitous, which right now we have thus far failed at. Uh, precisely because if we try and push too hard, our users will stop using what we give them. Um, have you, um, have you any sort of, you know, observations? Uh, yeah, that that is the hardest problem in the web right now. Is that how do we go forward? Um, the standards process has failed. Um, the browser development process has failed. Um, we're stuck with the 1999 technology, and our options are either we have to figure out somehow to fix it and go forward or the web just becomes uninteresting and we go back to proprietary systems, which I, I think would be a, a tragic step forward, although, or a tragic step forward, I guess that is exactly what it would be. Um, so the, the problem I've been struggling with was how do we go forward? And my best hunch is that um, a partnership between the, the most important sites on the web, such as your company, such as my company, um, could be the thing that, that gives us the force, the power, to get these problems corrected. Um, I, you've already made some momentum with Gears. I don't know if you have a plan for how Gears goes mainstream. I'd, I'd be curious to find that out. Uh, uh, whether you have a plan or not, I, I think that is the most likely train that we should be jumping on to go forward together with.
Was there a particular mashup or something you had in mind that kind of made this idea come together, or did you just read the code, read you know what you could find, and go from there? I, I've been doing mashups since before you were born. Um, <laughs> um, I, I have some history with some of the people who've been talking here. Um, we had a company called Electric Communities some years ago, which um, was doing mashups, which had dimensions which go way beyond the stuff that we're talking about today. Um, but we recognized back then, back in the, the early mid-90s, that this stuff was necessary. Um, and we were sort of perplexed when the web became dominant without having anticipated any of those problems. Um, so now, in retrospect, we're discovering that we were right for whatever that's worth. But we also have knowledge and experience which allows us to look at the components that we have available to us today and see how to push them together in a way which increases their value. But with your, uh, just to, to extend the, the question, though, uh, is there a particular current example of a mashup which is a particularly good, a concrete example to be thinking in terms of? Uh, yeah, the question was, are there any specific concrete examples? and and I'll answer that sort of obliquely. Um, I'm all the time seeing examples of mashups that people want to make where I tell them, pull them apart. We can't do that yet. Um, so the examples are showing up all the time. And I, I don't want to be saying them right now because I don't want anyone to go, oh, that's a good idea. I'm going to go out and do that because um, we're not ready for that yet. Um, but there are certainly a lot of people who are getting excited about the possibilities in the mashup space who are doing things which currently are extremely unsafe. One example comes to mind of, uh, at the moment, if you uh, go to Facebook, they ask for your Gmail password to get all your contacts out. And we don't want to give all of your ability to send, receive, read email to, to Facebook. You just want to say, these are the people in my account that I would like to invite to, to Facebook. Um, <laughs> that kind of restricting of the uh, of the authority is is the driving force behind these capabilities. Thing. That's a really good example. And one of the nice things about capability systems is that they allow you to step down the power of the capabilities that you're dealing with. So you're not giving away the whole farm. You're only giving away the specific capabilities that you want to be giving away at that point. Yes? Do you think there is a safe way how the channel data type can be extended so lambdas can be sent to? I'm sorry, is there a safe way to do what? Uh, to extend the channel data type um, between WETs uh, so lambdas can, uh, functions can be sent? Uh, you can always send functions as source, and JavaScript will always have the ability to, to execute them. In fact, I think that's how gears are working now, that you, can, you could send a payload to a, a worker and, and have it execute it for you. OK, are we all done? OK, thank you, everybody. Thank <laughs> you.